Have you ever wondered how you could write Windows Form apps and make them testable using TDD? The secret is by following the MVP pattern. Let's dive in and see how it's done. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is create a form with some simple controls on it. Let's get that done real quick. Okay, uh, let's take a look at what we got so far. Looks like we got a first name text box, a last name text box, an email text box, a phone text box, and a save button. Cool. If we double click on the save button, Visual Studio will create a click event handler, which we'll use later on. The next thing we're going to do is create an interface that matches the shape of our form. You'll notice that all our properties are of primitive types, meaning they are very elemental value types, which have nothing to do with the Windows Forms or any GUI, graphical user interface platform. This is key to making our application logic testable. I'd like you to take a look at this form. I want you to notice how that each control on this form maps to a primitive type in this interface on the right. This is key to making the application testable. Windows form classes can't be put into unit tests, but simple classes like this one with simple properties, also known as POCOs, plain old CLR objects, can. Now let's create our presenter. The presenter is where all the business logic exists. I'll just place this new class in its own file with some auto refactoring courtesy of ReSharper. There we go. Now let's add a reference to our class library in our Windows Forms project. This way we can inherit the primitive interface we just created. With a little bit of editing magic, all our interface properties are implemented. The next thing to do is map our primitive properties to our controls. You'll notice that most of our property names in our interface collide with the control properties in our form. This is easily remedied by explicitly implementing the interface. The next thing to do is to ensure our primitive event gets called when the user clicks the button. We'll also wire up the primitive properties to the controls. Each property gets mapped to its respective text control and delegates its value to the text property of the control, getting and setting its value. At this point in the process, I noticed that I didn't have a control to display the error messages. Let me add a label to the display so that we can view those messages. I'll make its color red and I'll remove its initial value. This control will get mapped to a primitive type on the interface like the rest. Let's add that property to the interface now. I'm going to add another property for showing and hiding the error message. This is a Boolean value which can be mapped to the text box visibility property. We'll implement that in the form also. Okay, looks good. Now let's get started on writing some unit tests. Before we write an actual unit test, we'll need to create a dummy class for mimicking our form. You'll notice that there's nothing fancy about this class. All it does is inherit the primitive properties of the interface. There's no logic in this file. It's nothing more than a means for passing around data. The real action takes place in the presenter. We'll need to new up a new user and a new presenter. Notice how the user gets ejected into the controller? This is dependency injecting, and it's how we separate the UI logic from the business logic. We'll also have to add a method on our dummy user to trigger the save command, like we do with the click event on our form. Okay, now we're ready to write our first test. 
I think I'll start by ensuring that the first name is not empty. We're going to do the traditional red-green refactor test now. First, write a test that fails when you run it, red. Then implement its feature, green. Then do some refactoring and circle back. We've got three assertions going on here. One ensures that our data is in the correct state for our test, an empty value for the first name. Another to test to ensure that the error is shown via our Boolean value. And the third is our test for the actual error message. We've run our first test and it's come back red. Let's implement its feature now. This is a simple feature. Check for an empty value. If it's empty, then set the error to visible and add the error message. Notice how I copied the error message from the test. If our test is written based on the feature requirements, then using its value is appropriate for getting the test to pass. I think we're ready to see if our test passed. Let's go ahead and run it and see what happens. All right, we're green and that's good. Now let's try it out in the actual form. We'll have to add the presenter into the form and initialize it in the load event. Remember to add the this reference of the Windows form to the constructor of the presenter. Let's give it a spin and see how it looks. The first name is already empty, so let's click the save button. Looks pretty good. Empty value gets you error message. Just what we expected. Now let's check to see if the error goes away when we add a value to the control. We'll write some more assertions to check if the value message goes away when the value is right. We'll have to remember to add the save click because that's our only way to trigger validation at this time. Again, we're starting red, working our way to green, and refactoring as we go along. As expected, the test failed, but let's see what failed. The first thing checked was whether the error message was shown. Let me fix that and then run it again. Now I'll fix the error message string and run it again. Okay, all is green. Let's move on to another test. I'll rename the test to something that's more meaningful, like first name is not empty. Then I'll copy it and start on my next test. Checking for another empty value seems trivial, so I'll just copy and paste the former test. But I'm in for a little surprise. Now that I have two validations, I will need to ensure that the green state for either is added to each other's test. As we add features, things get more complex. This is to be expected, but the good news is that we don't have to do this testing manually. Once these tests have been written, we can rest assured that our app will behave as intended without having to run it from top to bottom to ensure this. I'm going to continue refactoring my tests and business logic until they meet the expected behavior using the red green refactor cycle. As I go along, I may discover bugs, like needing to concatenate error messages. This is just something that comes along with the territory. Okay, our app is back in the green state. Let's go ahead and spin it up and see how it looks now. We can add values, remove values, and everything appears to be working as expected. This is exciting. 
it's really good to see this coming together. I'm going to add one more test to check if there's an at symbol in the email. It's not the best email validation out there, but it's just something to keep us moving along in this example. Again, adding this new behavior causes me to have to check all other behavior to ensure everything works together as expected. Changing and checking until we finally get back to a green state across all tests. Okay, our app is in its final green state for now. Let's give the app one more live test and see how it runs. We can check for empty values. We can add values, remove values, change values. All seems to be working as expected. The best part is we won't have to revisit this manual testing because the unit test exists to keep a constant, vigilant, automated eye on the state of our application. In summary, the recipe for MVP is very simple. One, create your form in a Windows Forms project. Two, add controls but do not add behavior. Three, create a library project. Four, Create an interface that mirrors the controls on your form using primitive values. 5. Create a presenter class. 6. Create a unit test project and begin writing tests that exercise the business logic of the app. 7. Use red-green refactor to add features as needed.